God is good, and all the time, God is good. Our lessons this morning are found from Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 7, and Mark chapter 1, verses 4 through 11. Acts chapter 19. While Apollos was in Corneth, Paul passed through the interior regions and came to Ephesus, where he found some disciples. And he said to them, Do you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? They replied, No. We have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? They answered, Into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who is to come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul had laid his hands on him, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Altogether, there were about 12 of them. In Mark's Gospel, beginning verse 4 of the first chapter, John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, John was clothed with camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and want honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water. <coughs> but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Holy Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. The Word of God for the people of God.
We begin this morning with a announcement. We intended to be in-house worship this Sunday, um, January 10th, um, Saturday, January 9th. But I was exposed to the coronavirus and we're following protocol. Uh, for those of you that think I have it, as far as I know, I don't. I'm just following you know, our, our guidelines to the best of our ability, and um, you know, I make that promise to you. If I feel sick, I will not be around anyone. But if I've been exposed to somebody who tests positive for coronavirus, I become, um, you know, um, I have to follow the law just like all of you, and I request you all do the same. So anyhow, we will begin next week, hopefully, uh, with the carol service that we had planned uh, for this, this weekend. The message is entitled, The Force Within. Now, I'm sure that plenty of preachers have, have latched on to this worn-out illustration long before I even thought of it. But in all of the Star Wars movies uh, that I'm aware of, the heroes are always instructed by their mentors to listen to the Force Within. Now, obviously, the force that the Star Wars script writers are talking about is a very different critter than the force that we were baptized in when we became a believer in Christ Jesus. The Star Wars force can apparently be either good or bad. It's entirely up to the individual to decide which flavor or which part of the force they want to embrace for that hidden power in their life. Darth Vader, of course, chose the, the you know, dark side. Uh, Luke Skywalker, he, he chose his good. In the end, good always triumphs over evil. I, I guess that's, you know, the ultimate message here in those movies. But in the church, we're about something very different. For us in Christ Jesus, that, that, that movie thing, that's not how it works. Now that Christ has risen from the dead, and now that he is at the right hand of God the Father making intercession for you and for me, I mean, his promise before he left that the Holy Spirit would come and be in us, working through us, that should be a very vital um, part of our lives. And the presence of this force within us, it, it, it isn't the stuff that movies are made of. Uh, for some people, their entrance into the kingdom of God is a very dramatic experience, like Paul's Damascus Road experience. But for others, they couldn't even tell you the day they came to Christ. All they know is that they have that constant awareness of the power of God within. And for one, it might be holy boldness. For another, this power of God, it might actually be that peace of God which does pass all rational human understanding. Uh, for another, it might mean speaking in the tongues of, of angels. For another, it might be being able to, to speak in an actual language, like French or Spanish, you know, you never studied, you never learned, but with which God can use in cer certain circumstances, and this has been documented all over the world. I mean, it's, it's, it's happened again and again and again and again. But on the day that the church was born, the tongues that the believers heard, they weren't the tongues of angels that a great many charismatic churches seem to prize so highly. Uh, they were actual languages. They were dialects. Actually, <coughs> excuse me. Actually, from the areas <coughs> that these pilgrims were from, uh, they they all came to Jerusalem from you know regions some pretty far away, and of course people would speak in different languages, different dialects, and. I, I don't know why your average Christian speaks, when they speak of their baptism in the Holy Spirit, so many are, are thinking about this gift of tongues, the tongues of angels. That gift, by the way, is very real. I've seen it. I've experienced it. I know it's legit. But that's just scratching the surface. 
when it comes to the real power of this force that is literally lying in the heart of every true believer in Jesus Christ. Now, in our first lesson, Paul met some disciples. And I think the, the scripture is using the word disciples kind of loosely. Now, apparently, these 12 guys, uh, they had head knowledge of what following Jesus was all about, but they had never apparently taken the full plunge. They were never fully all in. They'd been baptized in the, in the baptism, you know, of John the Baptist. John the Baptist's ministry is when they were baptized. But they hadn't really gone any further. They had head knowledge that there was more to this walk with God than their ancestors had known. But they hadn't really gone any further than that. Now notice it's when Paul lays his hands on them and he prays for them specifically to receive Christ in their hearts that this force within them really gets jump-started and so it should be with you and I. Now he says, pick it up verse 2, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? And they replied, no, we've not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. Then he said, into what then were you baptized? And they replied, into, John the Bapti into John's baptism. Now, Paul, Paul said, John baptized with a baptism of repentance and telling people to believe in the one who is to come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Altogether, there were about 12 of them. Now, you know, you can attend church every day of your life, but that may not necessarily mean that you are a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, becoming a disciple in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not... It's not about head knowledge. It's not head games, not at all. It's entirely about a personal relationship between God and you, specifically God's Son and you. God's Son who died on the cross for our sin. God's Son who rose again from the dead and now sits making intercession for you and I. And in this day and age, whew, I am so glad that he is. I don't know about you, but every time I, I watch the evening news, I, I, I just get so angry and frustrated. <coughs> and, and sometimes I, I don't think, I think like a real believer in Jesus Christ. And I'm sure the Lord is making intercession for me when I, when I get into, you know, accusing other people uh, of things that, you know, uh, maybe they're guilty of, maybe they're not. But becoming a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, it, it's not head games. It's entirely about this relationship that we have with Jesus. Um, now, what that's going to look like, I think, in the life of every individual believer is entirely up to that relationship that every individual believer does actually have with our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in this instance, the force within these believers, it made itself manifest in the gifts of tongues as well as prophecy. Now, why those two specific gifts? Well, the simple answer is that's what the church needed at that particular time. That's what it took to build up the church. Now, the church of our day, we need to remember that God is working his plan. He always has been. He's working his plan to restore this world to its pristine glory. That was the way things were before the fall of the first man and the first woman. Now, contrary to our fragile egos, it's not about us. It never was, and it never will be. It's entirely about God working in us and through us for his glory and for the restoration of the entire world. Where when we sign on with Christ Jesus, we become part of something much bigger than ourselves. Now, our part in this is solely, um, it, it's based solely on our ability and our desire to welcome the presence and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ into our lives. Now, if I had my druthers for my life and my ministry, uh, the gift of tongues would probably not be first on my list. Instead, I would love to have the gift of prophecy. But even more than that, man, I would like the gift of discernment. And the truth is, uh, sometimes I, I feel that, you know, I got a little bit of that gift, but man, I, I want more. Because I've discovered sometimes my discernment's a little bit off, 
And I know that's because I, I, I'm just not strong enough in the Lord in this area. Now, I also treasure that gift of peace. That, that gift of peace that passes all understanding. And those are the gifts that I really want. Because the kind of gifts I want are those gifts that are going to help me be of service to my God. Recognizing everything about my life should be about Him. And I'm embarrassed to admit to Him the times when they're not. But what I've discovered is God doesn't necessarily give us what we want so much as what we need. Now, on the Sunday in which we celebrate the baptism of our Lord, we celebrate the power that God unleashed you know, upon the heart and upon the mind of every true believer in Jesus Christ. Now, this weekend, we celebrate the reality that we can be cleansed from all unrighteousness. No matter how horrific, no matter how deeply ingrained, entangled, you know, the things not of God that have been in our lives, on this weekend in the church, when we celebrate the baptism of our Lord, we celebrate today is truly the first day of the rest of our life. Yesterday, it, it doesn't matter as far as what our future holds for us. What matters is our walk, our journey with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, united in Christ, we become gifted into a body of everlasting life. And we all ought to be saying, Yahoo! I mean, that is an awesome promise and gift. Now, the question I think we need to continually ask ourselves is, why don't we have more power? Why don't we have more power if we truly are tapped into this force in which the Holy Spirit dwells within, you know, within our lives? Now, could it be that just like the first man and the first woman, our natural desire is to walk separate from God? Could it be perhaps that um, we've, we've bought into the enemy's lie that, hey, we're strong enough on our own. We don't need the power of the Holy Spirit to handle, you know, the mundane things of life. Well, I got news for you. If you're in Christ Jesus, he, he's part of everything of your life. I mean, you need to be people of prayer. And there is nothing sacrilegious about praying for something as mundane as for a parking lot, you know, a space in the parking lot when you go to Walmart. Now, to be perfectly honest, I don't know why we're, we're not strong at some times when the power of the Holy Spirit does truly indwell our hearts and rules our mind. To be perfectly honest, I don't have an answer for why we fail so often in, in spiritual battles. Just like Paul, I'm sure you struggle with this every bit as much as I do. Um, Paul writes, he says, for I know that nothing good dwells in me. I mean, <laughs> this guy's being perfectly honest. He says, that is in my flesh. For wishing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I wish I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not wish. But if I am doing the very thing I do not wish, I am no longer doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then that the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wishes to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. But I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then on one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other, my flesh, the law of sin. That's from Romans chapter 7, beginning verse 18. Now, Paul understood that it's only through the Lord Jesus Christ that we are going to overcome this world. When we let go, when we let God the power is truly amazing that can become unleashed in us if we don't get in the way. You know, addictions, when we let go and we let God, they ultimately lose their hold over us. 
fear, and moral failure, you know, they have no choice but to fall by our side when we claim the name and power that becomes unleashed within us when the Holy Spirit, you know, when we claim that baptism of the Holy Spirit, which, which happens when you, you receive Christ into your life. Now, every day that we purpose in our hearts to walk with Jesus and we heed that still small voice, that really is the manifestation of the Holy Spirit within us, I think we become one day closer to what John Wesley described as our going on to perfection. Now, John the Baptist's message to the people that he baptized was, there is one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. As the first disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ, you might even make the case that the Father actually ordained uh, John to be Jesus' greatest advocate, and indeed he was. John believed in him when no one else did. And John recognized it's all about Jesus, and it's about our relation to him. Now, when we can let go, and we can let God, I think amazing things can start happening in our lives. But we can also shut them down, too, when we get in the way. But when we can let go, and we can let God, uh, things can happen that are far beyond us. But it can only happen when we begin that lifelong process of learning to die to self and start living, you know, for our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus himself said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he'll give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it doesn't behold him, it doesn't know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. That's John 14. Um, but the next time the world or the enemy throws you a curve, just remember whose you are. Even before you were conceived, you were granted a destiny and a purpose to overcome this world. As we embark in a fresh new year, I, I think that's a great knowledge to have stored inside our, in our head. Now, John the Elder, and I, I believe most likely this was John the beloved disciple, um, he writes, Little children, you are from God, and you have conquered them. For the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore what they say is from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. From this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Now, as we embrace this whole new year, we might as well get used to the fact that, you know, at times we're going to have our share of uphill battles along the way. And there are going to be times when we're going to feel like, man, we're beaten before we even get started. But at other times, we're going to feel like ha, we are on top of the world. But let's just remember whose we are and the purpose that he gave us when he granted us power from on high in this baptism of the Holy Spirit. The truth is, you and I, we were made for days just like this. And we were made to overcome the world. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we do ask, Lord, that you just show us how we're getting in the way. Because we know, Lord, and your word is true. When we ask the Lord Jesus Christ into our heart, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us. And so, Father, we want more power. And the only way to get more power from on high is to die to self. Be gentle with us, Lord, because we are a stubborn people at times. We know what we want, but sometimes we don't do what we want. We pray, Lord, that you would help us on the road to be more like your son. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.